Today's guest is Terry Cole. She is amazing, you guys. She's a licensed psychotherapist and global leading expert in female empowerment. For two decades, she's worked with some of the world's most well-known personalities from international pop stars to Fortune 500 CEOs. She has a gift for making complex psychological concepts accessible and then actionable so that clients and students can achieve sustainable change or true transformation. She empowers over 250,000 people weekly through her blog, social media, media platform, signature courses, um, her courses, um, real love revolution and boundary Boot Camp. Plus she has a popular podcast called the Terry Cole show. Um, I recently heard her on Mark Groves podcast, create the love, one of my favorites in the biz. Um, and she's also the author of the book. If you're watching on video, I'm holding up here on YouTube. Um, and it's called boundary boss, the essential guide to talk true, be seen and finally live free that just came out. So she's going to talk a lot about this book and all of these concepts. It's like a, free therapy session, guys, get ready. Absolutely amazing. We'll go ahead and jump right into it. Here is Terry Cole. So I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite finds in the health industry in the last few years. It's something I use with all my clients, and that has been extremely impacting on me as well. And that's the upgraded formulas, hair mineral tests, their consults, and their nanoparticle size minerals. So um, I started on this path because I was taking in a high quality magnesium. And when I tested, I found out that I was extremely deficient in magnesium. And once I started using their nanoparticle size magnesium, my levels went right up. And what I experienced was incredible. I started getting more or REM sleep. I was, I realized I hadn't been dreaming in years, started dreaming again, and also noticed that I didn't think I had anxiety until I got my magnesium back up and noticed that I was experiencing quite a lot of anxiety and that went away and I was able to enter back into a place of calm and peace. And, um, it was just incredible. And so since then I've been using it with all of my clients and it's so easy. All you have to do, they'll mail you out a little envelope and you just put some hair in it and mail it back into their lab. And then you do a consult with them over the phone and they'll tell you all about your ratios, what's high and what's low, because you can't know this unless you test, there's no way to know. And you can't just crap shoot minerals. You have to make sure that your ratios are on point. So they will tell you exactly what you need more of exactly what you need less of to get those ratios on point. So you can have optimized brain health and hormones and sleep and metabolism. So, um, they're also giving you 10% off for being an inside out health listener. So that code is just inside out. So, um, go to upgradedformulas.com and just enter inside out at checkout and you'll get 10% off their consults, um, the hair tests and any products that you may need to get your ratios. Right. So, um, yeah, take advantage of it guys. It's something I use with every single one of my clients. It's been wildly impacting and I'm happy to be able to extend that discount onto you guys too, as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Hey guys, before we get into the episode, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about higher coaching. This is my coaching system and I get a lot of questions because, um, it's not just training and nutrition. We do that. I love training and nutrition, obviously, but we also do more. We do personal development and the way that's delivered is a 90 day personal development program that you go through with me when you work with me. So it's a video course with questions for you to deep dive in yourself for the first 90 days of working with me. Now that comes as part of a morning routine. I am really big on the morning routine and you ask any of my clients, I will push you on that because it's life changing. So we start with meditation and then we do gratitude and then that personal development program. Um, that's our deep dive psychologically. And after the 90 days, you go to the next level, you start doing what I'm doing currently. And it's a lot of strategic goal setting and it's really, really honestly, miraculous what's happening, not only in my life, but in my clients' lives. Like it brings me to tears when I get on calls with them. I'm like, do you see yourself? Like, do you see what you're doing? That is so cool. So anyway, that is um, for me, the bread and butter of my coaching. I love it so much. Um, also though, in, in regards to your body, I also like to go deep dive and see what might be holding you back. So that's where all the biohacking side comes in. We do a physiological deep dive as well. So we do blood testing, hair mineral testing, DNA testing, body composition, aura ring. Um, so your heart rate variability, your sleep cycles. Do you have any deficiencies? Do you have issues with sleep you didn't even know about? Let's find out, you know? Um, so 
that's that's how I approach things in higher. There's more. We do prizes every month. Nikes, Lulus, um, all my favorite products and foods to keep you motivated, to keep those habits up. We do three Zoom calls a week so you get support. We have a private Facebook group. We're all vibing and, and cheering each other along the way. We get raw and real and honest. And it's just, yeah, it's like... I created my life and I created my life the way I like and I like to deep dive with a bunch of bad A people that really want to optimize their lives and it's an honor for me to serve them in that. Um, so I just thought I would tell you about it because I don't know if I talk about it quite enough. So if you're looking for that, if you're like wanting the next level in your body and also in your life, truly, that's what we're doing. So. Uh, seeking bad A's <laughs> to join higher. I do have some spots open. Um, it is limited. I can only handle so many clients at a time, but if you would like to find out if it's a good fit for you, you can go to my website, taragarrison.com and you can request a call and we can see if, if it's a great fit for you. Um, and yeah, I, I just wanted to tell you guys about higher so you could get a little glimpse into what I'm doing on the daily. And if you're looking for something a little more self-guided, I do have my keto in and out program, um, on my website. Site. So you can either do a small taste and try it for eight weeks, or you can go a full year. That baby is comprehensive. There is a video of every recipe, video of every exercise. There's a 60 day course teaching you how to do keto or 30 days of keto. And then 30 days of bringing back the carbs, FAQ video library, Facebook group, like all of that. So if you're more of like the self guided person and you just want stuff planned for you, um, that is also an option on my website. It's taragarrison.com. I'll link it all in the show notes and all right, we'll go ahead and get into our episode. Okay. So Terry, thank you so much for coming and sharing this goodness with my audience. I was so excited when L Russ introduced us because sometimes I feel like L can be a little, you know, you have those people in your life that they're just kind of like on that vibration with you. And they're just like this little angel in your life, just dropping little gifts right when you need it. And yep. that was this interview. I'm so excited about because I had just come out of a, honestly, a, a relationship situation in which I realized I was like, Tara, you lacked some major boundaries there. You still have some work to do on a few things. And hopefully that's not offensive to him, but that is what was my experience. And, sure. um, I actually had just bought Mark Grove's boundaries course. I was like, I want to see what Mark has to say. I really respect Mark. And then I know you were just on his podcast. And so I was just like, you gotta be kidding me. The universe is like, here you go, Tara, here you go. Here's all the info on boundaries that you might be missing. And so, right. um, if you guys are watching on YouTube, I've got a copy of Terry's new book here. It's called boundary boss, which I absolutely love. And so I want to jump into some of the concepts of the book, but also just, you know, the insights that you've learned over 20 mm -hmm. years of researching and coaching people on boundaries. I want to just start first with how would you define boundaries? Um, you have healthy boundaries when you know what your preferences your desires, your limits, and your deal breakers are, and you have the ability to communicate them clearly and concisely with anyone. Beautiful. Wow. I'm going to like write that on paper and put it on my wall. <laughs> well, it makes so it can... easier. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, like I feel like boundaries, they're like this amorphous. We're like, what does it mean? It's so many things. And it means <laughs> I have to be mean and I'm rejecting people and I'm punching people in the face verbally and people are getting mad at me. And yeah, It doesn't have to mean any of those things because we can do it easily and with love when appropriate, with kindness when appropriate, with a little more heat when needed. But the, the essence to me, what having healthy boundaries means is that we let the people in our life know what's okay and what's yeah. not okay. Yeah. Can you dive into the root causes a little bit? Why we lack boundaries? What are the fears associated with it? Well, let's just go back to the scene of the crime, shall we? Because there's no way not to say it's what we learned in our childhood homes without blaming others. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, being like, I'm blaming my parents. I'm blaming this one. It's really about family of origin, culture, country, how chaotic or not your family was, whether there was abuse, addiction, neglect, um, your role in the family, there were lots of siblings and you were, you know, we, we all play a particular thing. So mm -hmm. all of those things come together to create what I name your downloaded boundary blueprint. Mm -hmm. So this is really a lot of this info is in your unconscious mind. So what I do, I walk people through in the book and I also have a course that actually just started this week, but there's still, people are still joining. If anyone wants to do it, it's terrycole.com forward slash B-O-S-S. 
which makes sense for a boundary boss. Anyway, so walking through the process of revealing, you know, Tara, you had a particular life experience. I had a particular life experience. Just if you were raised gender wise as a woman mm -hmm. in the US, North America, even Europe, because I've taught this course to women in 195 countries. And you're talking about like United Arab Emirate, like right. Bosnia, right. places where th there's not one place, not one country in the world where any woman was like, oh, yes, I was absolutely encouraged to assert myself, like not a chance <laughs> in hell. That didn't happen at all. So we have to, before we can even get into, because everyone wants to be like, just give me the scripts. Yeah. Just tell me what to do. Right. In the book, I have a whole entire chapter towards the end that is only scripts for every weird ass scenario and regular scenario, you know, bumping into your ex in the supermarket, bumping into people you used to be in a very religious church and you bump into them and they're like, we're praying for you, right? Which means you're on the wrong path, you're going to hell or whatever, whatever it is, whatever it means to them. So I'm talking about <laughs> scripts for everything you could find yourself in. Mm -hmm. But that won't help you if you don't do this deep dive into your downloaded boundary blueprint. And again, it's for information, right? We need to know like, huh, well, this makes sense. My maternal impactor, let's say, was a people pleaser. She was a pushover. She was a chameleon. She was a peacekeeper. If those things are true, you may you look as a kid and you go, well, I want to be like her, right? This is your you were were connected to our parents or whoever raised us, the adults in our life, I used to, I usually say. And so no, nobody on purpose is like teaching us bad stuff, but the truth is we are getting and have gotten so much corrupted data about the way to be in the world, about what it means to be a good woman, a good person, a good son, a good daughter. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what the, the book is doing in the beginning is making sure that the reader is very clear about why they relate to boundaries the way that they do, because you have a million and five incredibly good reasons to be relating to them that way. If you grew up in a chaotic or an abusive family system, you don't need to get like an inner office memo from someone to tell you how to survive, right? We just know. Right. We're like, oh, it's my job to make sure the adults in this scenario get what they need my needs don't mean crap. And if I try to assert my needs, I might get physically harmed. I might be emotionally rejected, all the things. So mm -hmm. it isn't like someone has to teach us. We just know how many kids become parentified as children. So then that right. imparentified, if you don't know, you know, listeners, I know you do, <laughs> but other folks might not, where, you know, you have adult responsibilities on your young shoulders at an age when maybe you can do it, but you shouldn't have to. Right. And what that breeds is this over-functioning, over-giving, over-feeling, ridiculous amounts of codependency, which all of those things describe disordered boundaries. Yeah, I can definitely relate to all of that. And I love what you're saying because it's the same with health and fitness. Everybody just give me a meal plan. I'm like, you don't need a meal plan. Like, I mean, we can give you one, but that's not where the magic's going to happen. Why? What, what are your belief systems? Is it normal for you to eat a bunch of food at night after dinner while you watch TV? If that's your per perception of like normal and acceptable, anything outside of that is going to feel wrong, weird, and you're always going to want to default back to your normal patterns. Yep. And right? you so, feel so deprived, right? Because right, in a way, when right. you go, oh, what's the emotional association? I worked hard all day. I get to eat right. popcorn at night because that's my reward. Right. Same thing with drinking. So if you're like, well, just don't do it. Like Nancy Reagan, right. remember? Just don't do drugs. Like, hi, that shit yeah. does not work. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. <laughs> if I could just not do it, Nancy, I would have not done it to begin with, you know? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So deeping and digging into the deeper stories. And I love how, you know, the part one of your book is connecting the dots to the past, right? So we have it to is. go back, we have to revisit, or we just completely lack awareness because you're right. It, it's like, you know, Don Miguel Ruiz and the four agreements, it's these unconscious programs that are yeah. completely controlling our lives. So I love that you guide people through back through so you can take a look, see what's in there. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, 
how, how do you feel people? Cause sometimes I think, you know, for the longest time, I didn't even know I had a lack of boundaries. Mm-hmm. I just thought I was nice. <laughs> I just thought I was a great person who everybody mm-hmm. liked and, you know, all these people pleasing codependent behaviors. So how do, what are some signs of a lack of boundaries in our mm-hmm. lives? Um, check in with who you have resentment for. Mm, wow. Where are you feeling constricted when you think about something? Maybe you Oof. think about work and you get that constricted feeling in your chest. Like, I can't mm. believe Betty is dumping her work on me again. And I can't believe Oof. I'm doing it. Yeah. Right? So it could be professional. It could be personal. It could be family stuff, even friends. But I think a real, one of the first things, you know, after we do the deep dive into our own lives, we start establishing what are our own preferences because so much of the time when we're raised to be a people pleaser, our preference is to just not, I just like, would like you to not reject me. Yeah. I would just like to not have a conflict. Is that cool? Cause that's really what I would like. <laughs> yeah. But when you understand that that's the child within you and that that's, that's um, a wound that is still active from an earlier phase of development, we do a lot of work around um, honoring our, our experiences as kids because it actually matters. And I will say up front, like anyone who has untreated complex childhood trauma, untreated complex, right? So not trauma, many, 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 many trauma survivors. That's not what I'm saying. If you've done your work, if you're not having active flashbacks, if you're not having intrusive memories and dreams and thoughts right now, the book, my course is great for you. If you have any kind of untreated complex, especially childhood trauma, there is nothing that you do virtually or a book, like you really need, if it's accessible to you, serious help because this stuff can be very activating and you don't want to be, you don't want to crack open something that your mind has worked so hard to keep together and closed and in the basement. Because how I describe part of this process is I'm walking you into the basement of your mind, which is your unconscious. So you want to make sure that you're not going to be super surprised by anything that you find, you know? Um, And I just feel like to be responsible, yeah, you want to make sure that you're really, you know, to the best of your ability, taking care of yourself. And if you, and it isn't like you have to have money to take care of yourself. There are lots of, and we can, we can put them in the show notes, Tara, Mm -hmm. Um, free resources, you know, if you're in an active situation right now, domestic violence type of a thing, I've got um, something like how to safely and very quietly leave an abusive relationship. No, no broadcasting. So anyway, I just say that because I'm a therapist. So I just want to make yeah. sure that we're keeping people safe. Yeah. But for most of us, we're, we're well aware of what we've experienced. We just haven't thought about it in a long mm-hmm. time. And we haven't made the connections like, I always say like, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm nobody's guru for sure. Right. But I'm a damn good GPS to get you to the information that you need to be liberated from these unsatisfying repetitions, because that's what ends up happening. The way the mind works is that we repeat what we do not repair. You know, that's someone else's mm-hmm. quote, but I love it. Mm-hmm. What's her name? Oh, oh, Brady or something. Um, and, you know, Freud would call this repetition compulsion. Mm. because it's very counterintuitive. When I would tell this to my clients, they're like, well, why the hell would I do that? Like, why would I repeat this painful thing that was terrible and I didn't want to? Part of it is it's the way the mind works. I like to think of it like the kid in us would really like a Mm. do-over. We really just would like a better ending than the one we had. Right. And you can, of course, we can't get in a time machine, but you can create better endings now if you have properly honored those past experiences, because if not, what happens, and we can, I'll give you an example of this now, because it really is a boundary um, block. Mm. If you don't realize that you are having these repeated experiences. So anything in your life, you can think about it right now and go, well, how am I here again? Like whether it's a relationship with someone who is unavailable, whether you say I'm going to not only drink on the weekends, but I'm um, doing it. Now. There, there's so many different scenarios where we go, I have no idea how I could possibly be here again, but here I am. So we want to understand when either there's two things, either we're in a repeated situation or we're having a, a very, um, amplified response 
to a situation where in the moment it may be hard to identify that, but you, you'll you have people around you be like, wow, like you lost it. W- was there more to that than what I saw? Like there's something where clearly there's other information or something that's going on that creates this amplified response. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, other people and online people, I hardly ever use the word triggered because people say it all the time and I can't stand it. Um, <laughs> and I feel like people who don't know what it means say it all the time. Mm-hmm. And it's so, it, it takes away the power of what it really means to trauma survivors mm. to wow. actually be triggered where it is like a very transportive and very scary experience. Right. I, d- I don't like to hear it on TV and I get so mad. I always say mm. being activated, right? Because yeah. it is activating something from the past, but that's really not the same as having, you know, post-traumatic stress right. syndrome right? and being triggered. Anyway, Right. Look at me just being all like psychotherapeutically no, annoyed. I love that. But- no, I love that insight. Yeah. I have words like that too. You know, the word toxic can be very overused. <laughs> and so I'm just like, okay. <laughs> You're like, but but are they really toxic? Yeah. Or, or perhaps are you, uh, <laughs> are you using that? Yeah. <laughs> maybe point those fingers back at yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Overused and misunderstood is, is my concern with all that stuff is that if you don't really understand, and again, I'm not being like, oh, I'm so fancy. I understand. It really is talking true, which is part of the subtitle of the book, right? It's Boundary Boss, the essential guide to talk true, be seen, and finally live free. The art of talking true. Like I am a big devotee of talking true. And that means talking straight. Mm. That means being direct. That means not using a bunch of sarcasm, passive aggressive communication when you're um, upset about something. I'm not a big fan of that. Although I was a huge fan of that in my twenties, that was like my main way of communicating. (laughs) So trust me, I'm not judging anyone. But what I found after being a therapist for 24 years and being in my own therapy for 30 something years, is that it undermines our efforts and abilities to be authentically known, Mm -hmm. to be accurately known. To be accurately known, we have to know ourselves. And you don't have to know yourself perfectly, but but we can't just be reacting, acting out, um, having, and the difference between reacting and responding, right? Responding is aspirational. Most of us walk through life completely, simply reacting to yeah. stimuli. Someone does this, I want to punch them in the face. I don't even know why I want to punch them in the face. I mean, unless it's obvious, right. but I'm saying sometimes we'll have that big response. Like I was saying, we don't understand what's going on. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about transference and about the repeating boundary realities, as I call them, or repeating relationship realities. Mm-hmm. I was in a job and it was during my grad school. And I was working at um, a drug treatment clinic and I really disliked the guy who ran it. He was a famous author. This was like, you know, the nineties. So it was like cocaine was very, a very big thing. He wrote a very mm-hmm. popular book about that. Mm-hmm. And I would go into therapy for a couple of weeks in a row being like, oh, he's a, Dr. Washington's a jerk. I don't like him at all. He is so judgmental. He's so rejecting. He so thinks who he is. He so thinks he's superior, like all these things. And then she was like, okay, so this, the last time I came in, she's like, all right, so do me a favor. Why don't you physically describe him again? I was like, you know, he's tall, he's handsome, he's got a very deep voice, he has dimples. He's like that Brooks Brothers suit wearing Wall Street Journal reading martini guzzling golfs on the weekend. You know the type. And she was like, (laughs) hello, Terry. Who else could fit that exact description? I was like, oh my God, how embarrassing. My father, she was like, yeah, hello. And she explained, so I was avoiding this guy at work. Like he would walk down the hallway and I would literally dive into the ladies room to just not pass him. If he was in a meeting, I would not say one word. I would be like, whatever. Like not even feeling or seeing what was happening to myself. I fully believed what I was saying, that he was just a jerk, even though I barely knew the guy. Anyway, so she was like, Tara, you're having a transference. So when you see this guy, right? You become your 10 year old self with your father, who I feared growing up. He was very emotionally unavailable, not home, should have had sons, had four daughters. I was his fourth. I mean, there was a million, you know, big backstory. Yeah. And he becomes your rejecting or unavailable father. So 
why is this a problem? She's like, well, because if you don't, if you don't figure this out, if you don't recognize in the moment that you've been like unwittingly transported to an earlier injury in your life, she's like, how will he know how smart you are? How will he know? Don't you want a job at this place when you graduate? And I was like, yeah, that's a good point. From that moment forward though, when she helped me realize I was having a transference, the moment I was able to reassure the child within me, I was like, oh, P.S., he's not your father and you're not 10. I, that for me disappeared. Now, I'm not saying it always happens like that, but a lot of times, sometimes transformation takes a lifetime. And other times it takes a moment, an aha moment, um, insight, an epiphany. And you go, holy crap, I had no idea that I was, my behavior in this present moment was being fueled by my unresolved feelings from a past situation that was similar, that mm-hmm. reminded me. So mm-hmm. I came up with this little tool. This is for all the listeners right now, that if you find yourself in a situation, either you don't understand your reaction to the person, or it could be, it could also be a repeated situation. You're just going to ask these three questions. It's super easy. And I guarantee you some insights might flow from it. One, who does the person remind me of? It could be their energy. In my case, it happened to look like my father also, but it doesn't have to be. Could have looked like someone else, but have the same energy as that person or even mannerisms, right? Mm -hmm. Who does this person remind me of? The second question is, where have I felt like this before? Mm -hmm. And the third question is, how or why is this behavioral dynamic, the way I'm interacting with this person, which was me avoiding me being afraid and avoiding. If I had asked that question then, if I'd known, I mean, I created this so that my clients could get out of these transference reactions very quickly, rather than sort of ruining your career because your boss reminds you of your abusive dad. Make sense? Right. And I love this example because not only is he not able to see who you are, but you're not able to see who he is because you've just pegged him. He's that guy. Can't even see who he really is. Both of you are blocked in this story. It's and it's also inaccurate. Yeah. Right. It's wrong. This is corrupted data corrupting yeah. the current because my father right. wasn't bad either. Yeah. He just was limited. He just was broken emotionally. He just, but he wasn't mean or abusive or terrible or anything. He just wasn't present, you know? Right. So I had a huge story about what an ogre he was. Right. And because I needed to idolize my mother because she was the one who was present and I needed to make him the bad guy, whatever. I mean, we all do this as kids. This is how we just manage any chaotic situation. But in that discovery, the liberation from just being able to go, huh, you know who's not my father? Dr. Washington. He's actually a very smart clinician. He actually written a couple of amazing books like and literally did not one thing bad to me. <laughs> yeah. Not one. And I did get hired at that mm. place because the moment I wasn't afraid of him, I was <laughs> letting myself shine in the meetings and whatever. Right. I love this so much because as, and I think self-compassion comes in so much when you can approach it this way, because as a kid, you just didn't know that much. You didn't have the, honestly, the brain development to be able to make sense of what was happening, to have compassion for your dad, to put yourself in his shoes, to see things more maturely. But when we revisit it as adults, now we have all that data. We have more data points. So if we don't ever go back and revisit those unconscious programs, we're just literally living as a child in our adult lives in so many ways. Yeah. Which is really what happens when we don't heal those, those childhood injuries. But I do think it's important to note that so much of the work that we do that leads up to actually changing the boundary dances in your relationships and establishing new dances with new people, like how do you do it? What's the language? How do you get out? How do you shift the ones you're in? We actually really do have to honor what we experienced. And I think that with a lot of kids Mm. who were parentified or had, you know, like too much on their shoulders or whatever. Like, like had we all had parents who had their limitations. Obviously, we all had adults in our life. We wouldn't even call them parents because it could have been an auntie. It could have been anybody. But the kid in you has been making an excuse for their failings for so long mm. that it's very important in the beginning of this process that we only focus on what you experienced, mm. that we don't make it okay right? Yes. My adult self can say, wow, 
course, my father, you know, as Louise Hay says, right? Mm -hmm. Just all of, I see my parents as like the wounded kids that they are. Great. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the child within you doesn't need to, because the child within you or me or anyone needs to just be like, hey, that sucked. Can anyone just verify for me that that sucked and that yeah. I kind of got ripped off and that it would have been really great if I didn't have to cook dinner in fifth grade for everybody or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it isn't like we stay there forever. Mm -hmm. But what I find is that when we are kids of chaotic family life or abuse of any kind, we're so quick to, to put it on ourselves. When you're, when you're in the situation, you're like, well, if I could just do it better, they won't behave that way. I can, I can help them not lose this job. I can, I right. can, I can be better. I'll be perfect. And then right. it'll be better. So there's something very um, liberating and hard, difficult, I find for my clients to just recognize like, wow, you know what? Straight up, this is the way the adults in my life failed me. Just straight up. I don't need to make an allowance for them because hi, I was five. Like I get to just go, that sucked. It hurt my feelings. I'm crying now. I'm so sad about what, how I got ripped off. I so wish my parents were not, or my parental impactors were not limited in the ways they were. There is something so true about allowing ourselves to just be real with what happened and allowing ourselves to be mad because I can't tell you the number of clients who've come through my door who are so resistant to doing the work around the ways that their parents failed them mm -hmm. because they're like, oh, come on, that was 30 years ago. It's, I should be over by now. What the hell's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. And my mother was very um, good to teach me that she's like, listen, you know, she'd owned her mistakes, wrote me a note. I remember I was living on West 66th Street in the city of Manhattan. She, I just got this little card. She was like, dear Terry, I hope one day you can forgive me for the ways that I failed you. I've asked God to forgive me and I've been working on forgiving myself. I know I made some choices that caused you a lot of pain. I love you, mom. And I was like, wow. I mean, and there was a full on, I'm so sorry in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I never thought I needed that because I was, I've always been very close with my mother. I just accepted her. I like, she's a great mom, still alive today according to me. And yet it was so healing. It was true. She did make choices that created painful experiences in my life. And it was so threatening to ever really talk about that, but her just owning it, like, I'm just mm -hmm. sorry for the ways that I like failed you. So I always say to my clients, kids don't need to hear because they're like, now that I'm getting healthy, I really, I feel like I've just ruined my children, you know? I'm like, listen, <laughs> you could just be friggin' sorry for the ways that you failed them. Please don't ever say, I was doing the best that I could. No shit, but that's not an apology. Like, we get it. We feel like if you could have done better, you would have. It's okay. We all. I, I have kids mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. I ju just, we just don't, don't tell them why you did it the way you did it. Right. An apology is, I'm truly sorry for this decision or that decision or the ways that I failed you. That's yeah. it. That's what I said to my kids. That's it. You don't say you did the best that you could because that's an excuse. Right. And if we're going to honor their pain, we don't want to do it. anyway, yeah. off the beaten track, but those are boundary things too, though. Yeah. I love right. that insight. Um, you never hear that. I, I never hear, you never hear like allow yourself to, admit that it sucked. You know, I, I have yes. a lot of childhood, a lot of mm -hmm. childhood stuff. And my mom was like undiagnosed mental illness, you know, mm -hmm. single mom, five kids. I was the youngest. It was crazy. Oh. And, um, I do a lot of work, um, with a facilitator of the work of Byron Katie. And one of the most mm -hmm. profound sessions I did with her was, um, I had this belief, this, this thing, I did exactly what you said of, I just want to have a good relationship with my mom. And if I just am like more perfect and more kind and more forgiving. And when she goes off on some crazy thing, and is screaming at me. Like, I'll just like make it better and be like, that's okay, mom and love her anyway. And all this stuff. Yeah. And then I would end up feeling like a failure because I would lose my shit and start yelling yeah. at her and, of course. <laughs> um, and then feel bad and then try again. And that whole thing. And yeah. what I finally came to, you know, the thought I was working on was I want a good relationship with my mom and we ended it. We got to, I want a real relationship with my mom. It <laughs> is what it is. 
Like, how about we just accept it for what it is instead of this rose colored glasses thing that I had picked up as a coping mechanism that was infiltrating all my other relationships. So I love that. It's like, allow yourself to just be real about how it was really great. But Tara, that's super deep though. I just want to go back to what you just said for one sec, because like it's, it is such, um, it is such a gem that you had a coping mechanism to sort of be hyper positive Mm-hmm. about your mother and about the potential. And that was then infiltrating its way into other relationships. I called this process, the lies we tell ourselves. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because, and that gets in the way of us drawing boundaries, but very specifically, like if we make excuses for people's crap behavior, right? Because we don't know how to create a boundary. We don't know how to say the, we don't have the words to do it. So we, we, you know, what are we getting out of allowing people their bad behavior? Well, we get out, we, what we do is we don't have to have the conversation. And so we know it, we feel bad, but we're like, oh, I don't know. You know, she's always like this at the end of the month. I know she, I think she's PMSing. So it's, I know she doesn't mean it, right? I don't, I don't, you mean it, you don't mean it. You should not be a punching bag for anyone. And yet we find these ways to make excuses yeah. to, so that you could keep that, that um, rose colored glasses on, yep. right? Be happy yeah. through yeah. the shit. Exactly. exactly. Right. Yeah. Yep. It's been so eye opening because it's, it led to tons of excuse making in like every relationship in my life and this constant codependent, like, that's okay. I love you anyway, despite all these yeah. terrible things <laughs> that you're doing to me. Like, that's okay. No worries. It's, it's fine. Like it's understandable. Right. Yeah. So it's been quite the journey, man. Mm. And, and that, that led me to quite a journey on codependency because I always thought, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Cause I always yeah. just, you know, you hear codependency and passing. I never really looked into it, of course. And I just thought it meant, mm-hmm. Oh, somebody who like, can't be alone. They're like really clingy. And I'm like, surely I'm not like that. I'm not, co- I love being alone, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I started looking into it and I was like, that's not what codependency means. So it turns out. Um, and at, at least this is my co- current perception of it. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what I learned was that codependency is more when you don't expect the same respect from others that you keep giving them. You Mm -hmm. don't expect that same kind of treatment. Um, and it's this like pleasing, um, pattern that just keeps going on forever. And I was wondering if you could hit on that, the codependency connection with boundaries. Yeah. Oh my God. That's so funny. I think that's exactly what the chat it's called. That's what it is. Yes. (laughs) Oh, is it? Oh my God. I was like, I've been reading. I've been reading. (laughs) It's funny. I actually have a codependency course with Mm. Mark Groves called mm. crush and codependency. And if people are interested, they go to crush codependency.com crush codependency.com. Yeah. All right. It's, I will get that. I have to say it is so <laughs> effing good if I say so myself. Um, okay. So let's talk about codependency and take a quick story. I had all of these very high functioning female clients. Um, you know, you attract sort of who you are. So successful, you know, overgiving, overdoing, um, saving other folks all the time be, being, you know, keeping the driving all of their relationships with their proactiveness and all of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they were so high functioning, you know, that they were also like running businesses, entrepreneurs and doing all the things and all the things, being all the things to all the people. So if I would say, oh, hey, I'm noticing this codependent pattern, they would be like, no, 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 no. You're confused. (laughs) I'm no, everyone's dependent on me. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not codependent on squat lady. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you don't get it. I was like, okay. Mm. And, and I had that response many times. So instead of explaining it, because a lot of times we have this old idea of codependency, codependent, no more Melody Beatty. You have to be involved with an addict. You must be an, an enabler to some addictive something. Mm-hmm. So, so many people just out of hand go, no, that, that isn't me. So I created a, a new moniker because I didn't, I also didn't identify. I was highly codependent, but I was not involved with addicts. You know what I mean? Uh So I created high functioning codependency. Hmm. And that is a bit different. Hmm. So it's, you make it look easy. People do come to you. You're very shiny, right? People think you have it all together, even if you don't, because you are getting it all done, but at the expense of yourself. So my definition of codependency is if we are overly invested in the feeling states, the decisions, the outcomes, the circumstances 
of the people in our lives to the detriment of our internal peace, our financial or physical well-being, right? We, we do it to exhaustion mm -hmm. because, listen, we're lovers. We're going to be invested in those things about the people, you know, in the people, for the people we love. But being concerned is not the same as controlling because let's really think about what is any kind of codependency, covert and overt bids for control. That is what it is. We don't want them to make that mistake. We don't want them to not have a job. We don't want them to fail. We don't want them to be sad. We want, yeah. we're giving auto advice. We are endlessly fixing others. So we are the ones that people come to. But what's really happening, and this was so painful, what a painful realization personally, many years ago, many, but still sucked, where what we're really doing, because I couldn't control a lot of things in my childhood that I wanted to control. So I controlled what I could, right? I became that over-functioning kid that when we're doing this to the people that we love, when someone comes to us and we go, okay, so I'm going to, uh, you know, making a phone call for you. I sent you something, uh, a Google document of my ideas. There's another thing. I saw this podcast you should listen to. I did this other thing. I mean, just, just I could keep going. I won't, but you get it. Mm -hmm. What we're really doing is, A, we are assuming that we actually have the answer mm -hmm. for someone else. And B, we are centering ourselves in the middle of that person's experience. And even if they're inviting us to, even if they're asking us to, we really don't belong there because you really don't know what's right for your friend to do. And as much as even being married, like, I don't know. My husband has to make his own decisions, right? It can't be me. I can say, hey, do you want to brainstorm that? I can say, hey, I have an idea. I have a thought. Are you open to hearing it? But most of us don't even know to do that. And I learned to do that after being this intrusive, very masterfully controlling person because people would be like, no, she's amazing. She's always there for you. She's, she's the best friend. She's the best sister. She's the one everyone goes to. But here's the thing, who knew me when I was doing that? And the answer is nobody because yeah. I was too busy being of Ooh. service. <laughs> yeah, it was all about them all the time, <laughs> right? And wow. then inadvertently about us too, though, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we need. I needed to be needed. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be centered in their lives, to be irreplaceable, mm -hmm. because then I don't have to worry about you leaving, and then that's all abandonment stuff. So there's a lot of reasons why we grow up to be high-functioning codependents, but the cost is so high, and the truth is only when I cured that within my own therapeutic process. And then I became a huge champion for that too, because listen, codependency by virtue of its definition means your boundaries suck, <sighs> right? You can't have yeah. healthy boundaries and be an active codependent, like not possible. They're not, they don't go together, you know? Yeah. Yeah, man. I look, I mean, I look at my past personally, as you discuss all this and it's like, not only that I have that, I had physical, emotional, and sexual abuse my whole childhood. And on top of it, I was raised in a very dominating religion, the LDS religion. And I, man, I feel like when I came out of all that and like really truly, I hit rock bottom as a result of it. And it was just like, for, I, by sheer force, it was like, Hey, you got to look at all your patterns because you think you're so nice and all, but actually like, this is where that's gotten you. So wake up. <laughs> you yep. got some, you got some stuff to look at, you know, and it's still a process that was like four years ago and I'm still Amazing. very much in it and definitely admittedly. So I'd love, thank you for sharing all these gems. Cause it's just pinging off. Like, I'm like, I need to go to therapy. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yeah. When we're done, I'll give you a good referral. Okay, great. <laughs> we'll put uh, put all these resources that Terry's talking about in our show notes too, guys. So if you want that, we'll, we'll get we'll get you taken care of. Um, I, I was wondering if you could describe this concept that you talk about of going from a reactive to a proactive boundary. What does that actually look like? Well, it's a little bit like what we were kind of just talking about that we're always in a reactionary mode unless we consciously change our minds and get the skills to create some space between the thought yeah. and the action. Yeah. So I teach you to meditate in the book. You know, we've got a whole other, other ways of creating more inner, inner space, but part of it is proactive boundaries means that we think 
about an interaction before we have it. We don't just confront people willy nilly. We go, oh, okay. So I want to tell my partner that I don't like them. You know, I, I, I don't want them coming to bed so late. I don't like it. I, I don't sleep well till they get there. I'm going to see. So then I think about them and I go, okay, well, how, how do they respond in the past? Are they defensive? Are they not? It's actually a dumb example, but you get the point. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It could be a bigger example. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go on that vacation because I'm worried about COVID, but you're not, whatever, whatever the conflict is. I, we always think about it. So I give you this like five-step process where we look at the history with the person. Are they open to things usually? How does it end up? How is your communication with the person? What do you really want? What kind of language are you going to use? So I help you with all of that, like scripts and whatever. And they're easy things like, hey, I'd like to make a simple request Mm -hmm. that at least twice a week, you come to bed before midnight, because if you don't, I'm always waiting for you with one eye open. So can can we meet in the middle? Will you agree to that? that? That's, again, so much of the time people don't set boundaries or have the boundary conversation because they're just like, crap, I was right there, but I just, no words came. I didn't know what to say. So and they just keep resenting them forever. I guess. Oh yeah. Really, they oh, always no, go to bed late. <laughs> it's like, I've got the file cabinet. We're just going to like, why Bob is an asshole again, <laughs> right. going in there, just <laughs> filing something in the filing cabinet exactly. of resentment. You're like, don't worry. I'll be going back to that later. <laughs> We do a visualization as part of the process of a proactive boundary where you you feel the feelings. Because listen, when we, whatever energy we bring into these boundary interactions, that other person feels it, which is why we do all of this pre-work about your relationship to yourself, understanding your downloaded br- blueprint, meditation, a ridiculous amount of self-care is in this book and in the course itself. Mm-hmm. Because it's so important, because literally it's about your relationship with you, sets the bar for every other relationship in your life. That's it. So if you're not good with you, if you have low, you know, a low opinion of yourself, if you talk badly about yourself to others, if you say mean things to yourself, like what an idiot you are, Mm -hmm. you will inevitably attract folks who agree with your self assessment. Oof. Beautifully said. Wow. Thank you. Okay. We have a little bit more time. I really want to hit on the boundary destroyers yes, that you talk you about do. in your book. Could you hit on that? I will. So I felt like I had to include, to be responsible, I had to include the personalities that we interact with, who the regular rules of engagement that I taught you throughout the whole book actually don't apply to these people because they are boundary destroyers, which is really like people with narcissistic personality disorder, a bipolar disorder, histrionic disorder. Um, they could be just people who are super contrary. You know, people who are just doesn't matter what you say, they just say the opposite of it. They're, they're petty, they're, um, they're thin skinned. So they don't, listen, we're not diagnosing anyone in the book. I don't do that at all. Mm-hmm. I describe your experience. And that's how you identify who you're interacting with. Love that. So in this chapter, I go over like the most common predatory behaviors that you will find from these boundary destroyers. So what is it that they do? How do they, how do they do the thing that they do? Well, they gaslight you, right? So that means they're, and your audience most likely knows this means denying your reality, really trying to have you um, doubt yourself yeah. and, and, and like what you know to be true. And they'll also just straight up lie to your face. That's, that's t- true too. They'll be like, that never happened. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I give you, I give you um, different scripts and strategies of how to deal with these people. They'll also, we have the love bombing, which a lot of people also are familiar with where it's all great until it blows um, because it's going to blow. If this person is a boundary destroyer or has some kind of a diagnosable um mental health issue. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's really painful too, because you've been merged with this person and then now they're discarding you or, you know, um, disparaging you or making you feel terrible. And you don't even get it because you're like, wait, wasn't I just perfect one minute ago? How how is this happening right now? I don't understand. So when you get more um, well-versed at the tricks of the trade, they flip the script. They do something sketchy you're like, I wasn't even looking at your phone, but it blew up at like two in the morning and I see that it's from a woman or whatever, let's just say. 
they literally are so masterful. They can flip that script and be like, oh, so you were in my phone. So it, it's about you. You leave that conversation where you're like crying and begging for forgiveness. You're like, how the fuck did that happen? Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. you're doing some sketchy shit and I know you are and I'm apologizing. I don't get it, but they're so incredibly masterful. So being well-versed, they also use faux concern where I really hate this one, Mm -hmm. where you're saying something they don't like. You're being like, Hey, I think you're being like sketchy in this way. And they go, babe, I'm really worried about you. (laughs) You're really, you're, I think you're going off the rails. Like I'm concerned. Then they use peer pressure. They say, Listen, you know, I wasn't going to say anything, but the other day Jenna was saying about how she really thinks you're losing it. And now I'm starting to think Jenna's right. I don't know. You're like, wow. now I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at Jenna. How did that just happen? Like you literally yeah. just, it was like the quick switch, Yeah. you know? So the more you learn about these techniques and I, it's all, it's pretty comprehensive in the book. So you just, you'll get to that chapter and you'll see it. Mm-hmm. What happens is you start to be able to identify like, oh, this is happening in this relationship and in this relationship and in this relationship. Now, we also do an inventory of like, who are you dealing with? Because you must know if someone is dangerous, if they've already been violent with you, again, I'm going to say, do not be applying anything from any book or anything online. You need direct help, Mm -hmm. even if it's virtual, right? I'm associated with betterhelp.com. We can put the link in there too. I vetted it for three months with 18 people anonymously. And the service is amazing. Cause you know, I, that's the only thing I've ever associated myself with in 25 years because you know, you're a therapist, you can't, anyway, they do a great job and they have specific trauma instructors if people need it. Anyway, I just say that because yeah. <laughs> your, your safety is the most important thing. Of course, yeah. the truth about boundary destroyers is that it's more about protection your protection. So I teach you to step back from them. I teach you how to not get sucked in using the gray method. Many of you have heard of this where you become, have you heard of this Tara? Okay. So the gray method is I did not create this. And it's funny. It's an anonymous anonymous person online is where I actually got it from. And that's where everyone, we all refer to the same person being like in this post from 10 years ago, but okay. Cause I didn't make it up, you know? Yeah. But it's, it's this theory that Someone, if they're a narcissist, and and even with some people, folks who are bipolar, they're, you know, we talk about narcissistic supply, which is basically your emotions, your pain, drama, anything that is dramatic and big and loud, that feeds, that feeds their narcissistic supply, as sick as that is, but it's true. So you become as boring and as bland as you possibly can. Look terrible. Don't even have a nice car. Like the the person who who originally um, got out of this terribly abusive narcissistic relationship went so far as to be like, I got rid of my nice car and got like just a beater because I knew that that was going to really bother him. And I became disheveled, didn't take care of myself, gained some weight, didn't care. Wow. So their partner would be like, wait, you're not going out like that. And you're like, yep, I already did. Wow. Give nothing (sighs) because they get bored. Nothing a narcissist hates more than being bored. And they will move on because you being boring. So think gray rock, right? It's, it's really, a, it's a, a notion that certain animals can make themselves look like a gray rock. So a predator right. mistakes them for a rock. That's, wow. that's the theory of it. So that's something, and you can look it up, but I also talk about it in the book of it's less about how do I manage a relationship with a boundary destroyer and make it better? Because the truth is I don't even have that much power. Like I don't, I don't have that much knowledge. Someone else might, but I don't, I think that the best you can hope for is to be super clear that it's unlikely that if someone is truly a boundary destroyer, that they will change. And that your the shift for you would be in protecting yourself stepping back. Don't give anyone, especially not a boundary destroyer, 24 hour access to you. Turn your effing phone off at night. Stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone else's reality is not your reality. This is your life. This is, you know, not to quote Cher, but you know, there's no dress rehearsal. Like we're live right now, people, this is it, (laughs) you know? And if you're involved with someone like this, it's like you're playing a bit part in the movie of your life that you're supposed to be starring in. (laughs) 
and directing and being the producer on and making all the decisions for. Right. No. So I do teach you to step back. And there are there, I definitely give you tons of scripts in that chapter as well. Even if it's just like, okay, well then we'll have to agree to disagree. When they're like, I didn't say that. Well, we'll have to agree to disagree because I know what I heard. Yeah. I know what my reality is, you know, mm-hmm. but again, we wouldn't say that to someone if we thought that would provoke them to violence. So th- right. there's a fine line, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And showing up for yourself. And I love that. Like you, this is your, you're the star of the show. So show up <laughs> for yourself. I, I love that so much. And before we close, first of all, I just have to say, I love that. Not only are you educating and like getting out there doing so much work to educate on this because we all need it. <laughs> like this we awareness was, we, not, I don't think anybody was raised with this at all. Mm-hmm. And so uh, thank you for creating so much awareness and then also creating so much follow through for people to be able to learn more. And so of course you guys get the book. It's called boundary boss, Terry Cole. Um, I will link it in the show notes, but also Terry, you have something for the listeners. You want to learn? I do. I have two other things. So get the book. You can buy it anywhere, but make sure you go to boundarybossbook.com because I have a whole bunch of free gifts that will help you along the path. I have a course that actually this week we just started. So I haven't even had my first real meeting yet of the course. So um, it was started on Wednesday and our first meeting is next Wednesday. So if anyone listening wants to join, I kept the door, the door cracked because I knew we were going to be doing this today. So if you're interested in that, it's called Boundary Boot Camp. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's me teaching you myself this whole, whole entire process. It's And you just go to terrycole.com forward slash boss, B-O-S-S. And your free gift, I'm giving you, it's a little video that I did, like a lesson, like a 12 minute lesson and a beautiful downloadable guide where you can answer questions. And it's about how to create energetic boundaries, Mm -hmm. how to protect yourself in your relationships, how to be less exhausted, because I bet your audience is like you, like me, empath, highly sensitive person. And it's exhausting if you don't know how to do that. So you can get that gift at, hold on, I'm going to make sure I get the URL right. (laughs) Because I don't know why, but it's so easy for me to say it wrong. It is so far away. Here we go. (laughs) Boundaryboss.me forward slash inside out. Thank you so much. And we will link that in the show notes on YouTube and in all the other platforms. So you guys can get that. Thank you, Terry, so much. Thank you for being you, for doing this work, for having such a high ethical standard in what you're doing. Um, and not just, you know, go stepping outside of your bounds. I understand that, 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 uh, professional it's like, oh, how much can I do on a mass level and how much can I not do on a mass level, you exactly. know, and, and, and being, you know, um, open with people about that. So they know. Yes. Um, so I really appreciate that high level of professionalism. And again, it's just an honor to have you. And thank you. This is like a gift for me personally as well. So thank you so much. I better see you in my course, Tara. I, I, I will be there. <laughs> thank you. TerryCole.com forward slash boss. <laughs> Thanks, honey. Thanks.